My friends at Easy Cater are workplace catering pros, helping you find food for everything from daily employee meals to staff meetings and special events. Visit easycater.com slash leader assistant to find out more. Welcome to the Leader Assistant Podcast, Episode 8. Hi, this is Phoenix Normand, and today's leadership quote comes from Theodore Roosevelt, one of my favorites. People ask the difference between a leader and a boss. The leader works in the open, and the boss in covert. The leader leads, and the boss drives. The Leader Assistant Podcast exists to encourage and challenge assistants to become irreplaceable, game-changing leader assistants. Phoenix Normand has been a C-suite executive assistant for 27 years. He's worked in banking, retail, technology, and most recently, aerospace. He created his workshop, Tribe U, after attending one too many expensive, large conferences and being left feeling uninspired, unchallenged, and with a stack of business cards of EAs he'd likely never see again. Tribe U has quickly become one of the top resources for top-performing EAs looking for effective education and community with other EAs at the top of the game. I had the pleasure of attending Tribe U in San Francisco earlier this year, and I was just blown away by the type of workshop and the quality of workshop that Phoenix put together with the high-caliber EAs in the room. So I'm excited to interview Phoenix today on the Leader Assistant Podcast. So let's jump right into the interview. I'm super excited today to have Phoenix Normand on the show. Um, Phoenix and I connected on LinkedIn probably a year, a year and a half ago. Yeah. And um, he's been very supportive and very encouraging of me in my um, EA coaching and EA blogging world. Um, so it's been really encouraging to get to know Phoenix and support him um, as much as I can as well. And so I will jump right in with uh, Phoenix with a couple of personal questions to kind of get kick started. <laughs> so um, Phoenix, why don't you just just give a real quick snapshot um, about what what uh, what you're up to right now? Uh, sure. Uh, thank you, first of all, for having me, Jeremy. I appreciate it. And congrats on the uh, on the blog. It's uh, you're doing well. I'm impressed. <laughs> thank you. So, um, so right now I'm working on a group, uh, if you will, called Tribe and Tribe You. So Tribe is a personal tribe that I'm pulling together of what I consider to be some of the top executive assistants in the world, um, as well as uh, EA advocates. I've got, um, of course, you and. Uh, and Al Hussein Madani on as well, which is great, and uh, a couple more, believe it or not, in the works. And the concept around it is really just to to bring together a group of people who are um, just as passionate about the role and really passionate about where it can be versus where it is. And we get together, we offer each other community, you know, we exchange tips and tricks and best recommendations and that sort of thing. But more than anything, we we sort of have just a the ability to sort of build one another up and to help each other, you know, gain more compensation, gain more confidence, that sort of thing. And it's something that I feel has been sort of missing in, um, in sort of the executive assistant realm for a number of years. Um, there are versions of it, clubs everywhere, but I think this is one way that we can sort of support one another, you know, 24, seven, 365, considering there are people from eight different countries, uh, on the private tribe. And then, uh, sorry, and then uh, obviously uh, Tribe U is, is my sort of traveling circus, I like to call it, <laughs> where I'm sort of helping uh, executive assistants really level up and answer those hard questions and, and really talk about the kind of crunchier topics just to really get people in the right mindset to to have the confidence to go to their bosses, ask for more compensation, ask for you know more needle-moving work, that kind of thing, where it's, uh, I don't feel you really get that push in sort of large, um, large conference settings, it's, it's easier to do it when you can look people in the eye and ask, you know, really tough questions and sort of in a cone of silence. So it's so far so good. It's going, it's going really, really well. I'm really, really happy with how it's going so far. Yeah, that's awesome. I, 
I, you know, I had the pleasure of uh, meeting you in San Francisco and attending your mm-hmm. Tribe U workshop and uh, just was very, very encouraged by it and very impressed with the um, participation and the high caliber of EAs that were in the room. And mm-hmm. so I think you've got a, got a good thing going and um, anybody listening that has a chance to uh, attend one of your workshops, uh, definitely check it out. Thank you. So what was your, before you were an EA, unless, unless mm-hmm. being an EA was your first job, what, <laughs> what was your very first job? Oh my goodness. My very first job is I worked at a video store. <laughs> nice. <laughs> video to go in Union City, California was my very first job. And uh, oddly enough, it taught me a lot. I, the, the funny thing is I was laughing with this or laughing about this with my mother just a, about a, a little while ago. And we were talking about uh, the things that kind of make us nervous or whatever else. And the one thing that freaked me out was making change. We don't even deal with cash anymore. But the one thing that used to freak me out was I was always impressed at the grocery store or something like that. When you give someone a 20 and they are able to make the change and count it back to you. I didn't understand the concept of counting it back. <laughs> I was just kind of like hand people a wad of cash and go, here you go. I think that's right. And uh, my mom actually taught me how to count change back to customers. And and I was so proud of that. And oddly enough, that was one of the things that um, it's weird. It, it kind of was a segue into becoming an EA, oddly enough, because not that we count change at all or deal with anything like that. But I enjoyed the, the sort of... Um, choreography around it all and um you know someone giving you something and you having to give them something back and return and do it in a way that made sense and that sort of uh you know closed the loop so oddly enough it who knows counting change probably led to my to my executive assistant days yeah i mean you got to keep track of the details so that's, uh, hey that's exactly good skill um so which companies have you been an assistant at um mm-hmm. and then what what kind of titles did you support? So for me, I started in investment banking. So I instantaneously started supporting, um, you know, managing directors, uh, that, uh, everything from, it's funny, they, they do them sort of in umbrellas. So you have like a, like a managing director. And then of course they have, you know, a ton of direct reports all the way down to a junior analyst role. So I felt like I, pretty much supported anyone from a junior analyst, you know, to a a director, to a VP, all the way up to, to the managing director. So that was pretty much 11 years of my life. And then, um, I skipped over to retail and supported the president of the, um, Levi's, uh, Levi Strauss brand. And then from there, um, ended up in tech where I supported, um, sort of softly supported Jack Dorsey at Square, um, supported the, the general counsel, and heads of uh, two of their largest departments at the time, which was marketing and product. And a lot of the products, obviously, that uh, that we built in, the, in my time there are now kind of ubiquitous uh, throughout the world, yeah. including those, you know, we went from that little square card reader to pretty much the uh, the, the point of sale um, machines that you see pretty much at every, feels like every coffee shop on the face of the planet, every small business has a, yeah. a some sort of a square POS on it, which is really, really, really cool. And then uh, from there, most recently ended up working in uh, aerospace, uh, supporting the executives, or excuse me, the, uh, the CEO who was building the next, or is building the next um, commercial um, supersonic airliner, which is pretty crazy when you think about it. So yeah. <laughs> getting from uh, San Francisco to Tokyo in seven hours versus 14 or 15. I bring it on, please. <laughs> yeah, that, <laughs> so, that, that would have been nice when I went to uh, Hong Kong. That was right. That was a long flight. That's a brutal trip, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, so, you know, aerospace retail, very similar. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. <no. laughs> so taking, taking a step back, like yeah. wh- why did you become an EA? I think for me, it was it was by chance. Like I, I get that a lot from executive assistants, especially when I ask them the same question in uh, in uh, Tribu. Like, how did you become an EA? And a lot of people just kind of fell into it. I fell into it. I was in a typing pool, which instantaneously dates me. But I, felt like I was uh, working in a typing pool at Montgomery Securities, my very first um, um, first real job job, and. 
I ended up kind of happening into uh, an administrative assistant role. Um, one of one of the bankers there, who was um, labeled the screamer, um, like sort of summarily fired his executive assistant um, on the floor, loudly enough for pretty much everyone to hear, and, and kind of run scampering away from the man. And sure enough, he um, I had been typing a lot of his research reports, was copy editing them without his permission, but. Uh. Um, his writing was terrible and I absolutely refused to let that go out of, uh, out of the department. So he came screaming in like shortly after he'd fired his assistant and asked, you know, who's, you know, editing my stuff, um, with a few choice words thrown in, of course. Mm. And, uh, of course everyone points to me like he's over there like, we didn't do it. That's him. <laughs> so they gave me up and sure enough, he's, uh, he actually ended up liking what I had done, um, and uh, asked me, hey, you know, you've been a typist, quote unquote. You want to stay in this hellhole? Sorry, was that a bad word? No, you um, did. Do you want to stay in this place? Uh, and uh, he's like, or do you want to be an admin? And I'm like, I'm, I'll try it. Why not? And I was off to the races after that. Wow. That's great. So what do you and what, what have you loved about the role of an assistant? I think for me, I like the chess play. Um, I've always been sort of strategic throughout my entire life. Um, and I've just enjoyed making things work and not having an exact script to follow. And the one thing I've found with being an administrative assistant and then an executive assistant is that no two days are the same. I've never ever worked at a company where my Monday looked anything like my Tuesday and my Tuesday looked nothing like my Thursday. It's yeah. always been something a little different and a little more challenging or, um, you know, just having to come at it from a little different, you know, dealing with different personalities to get to the same, uh, the same conclusion, that kind of thing. And I just, I don't know. I mean, I find that like salivating at the thought of, you know, walking in every day and, and trying to figure it out. And, uh, it's been that way for, wow, 27 years now. So yeah, that, I think that's it. It's just the, 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 the sort of chess play and randomness of it all. It's really kind of exciting to me. Yeah, I agree. I think my, that's kind of been my motto is there's never a dull moment. And I, you know, same, same as you, I don't show up thinking, Oh, it's going to be just like it was yesterday or this right. week's going to be just like last week. And it just right. keeps you on your toes and, and keeps things interesting. Exactly. Exactly. And there aren't many jobs in life, to be honest with you, as far as I found that uh, offer that sort of same randomness and the same, um, um, figure it out, if you will. Uh, yeah. a lot of them are just sort of very solo, very focused one note things. And I, I could not work like that. I get bored so easily. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so it's, it's worked out perfect for me. I think I literally from the jump fell into my calling. So awesome. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit about artificial intelligence. Um, as you know, I work for an artificial intelligence, uh, software Sorry, company and oh, yes. get a little bit of, uh, inside, uh, scoop to the future, but what are your thoughts on AI and what should assistants do, uh, to kind of prepare themselves for the future of work? I'm absolutely fascinated with AI. I mean, I'm fascinated pretty much with anything that even remotely sniffs of the Jetsons, I'll be honest with you. So, um, you know, this whole AI talk, which I know scares a lot of people or makes a lot of people sort of, you know, um, glass over, I'm all about it. I mean, I, I've, I'm fully immersed, meaning I've already taken one course. I'm um, about two weeks into a three month course in deep learning. I mean, it's, it's, it's just so fascinating to me. And the funny thing is, I'll, I'll give just a quick pivotal moment is the, um, Google had, uh, or they created an AI bot essentially that, uh, that they, that they, uh, introduced in sort of like this big fanfare, uh, um, press conference, if you will, um, where that particular bot, and you've probably seen this probably many times, uh, ended up, you know, calling and making a hair appointment, and then another one made a restaurant reservation. Mm -hmm. And just how perfectly done and how perfectly executed it was, including feel and texture of the voices, the the sort of almost um, what would you call it, um, just casualness of it, uh, and the fact that the person on the other line had no idea that a bot was calling them, right blew my mind like bull completely blew my mind and completely opened up like all these new synapses where i'm like wow this is going to be 
the thing very quickly. So, you know, to your question, you know, what do I think of AI? I mean, bring it on. I mean, I, I know the fear is that it's going to start defl- displacing people. And yes, that will happen. I mean, it's no different than, you know, um, automation has displaced people for, for decades, if not all over a century. Mm-hmm. But this is going to be in such a way where I don't necessarily fear it. I think we now, assistants, have an opportunity to really, you know, dig in and learn about it and, and try to really understand the inner workings and understand really the purpose of it as opposed to fearing the purpose of it. It's not to displace us, it's actually to enhance what we already do and take away a lot of the sort of, you know, mundane, very, you know, work that humans have been doing forever that we don't really need to do anymore. It's like hand it off to a bot and go do something much more, you know, exciting, much more needle moving. Yeah. And that's that's kind of how I approach this whole AI thing. I mean, I, I think we really, especially assistants, because we we tend to be that, that um, you know, I'm not only the biggest cheerleader, but also the sort of beta testers <laughs> for a lot of things uh, that go on in the company. So if we can really embrace it and really get, you know, get really intelligent about it, understand it and, and get a little bit deeper than surface level in our knowledge around it, then we can be the ones who help to bring it to life and help to, who know, you know, who knows, train part of the company or or at least advocate about um, about what it can do and how much, you know, how much easier our lives can be once we do implement it. So, yeah. So what would be like just a very practical, uh, takeaway for assistance that you would say, Hey, you know, do this one thing, um, mm-hmm. in the next few weeks or few months to really prepare oh, yourself gotcha. for AI. Yeah. I'd say one of the, a couple of things, like for instance, I, I did it in a recent class is, you know, download Google Assistant. Mm-hmm. That's the easiest thing you can do. It's free. You know, it's, it's free learning. It's the way I look at it. And the reason I say that is I, the idea is if, if it's a free app, it's something that you can sort of, um, you know, ask a million questions and, you know, make your questions really intense and make them really, you know, multi-legged and you know, anything just to get an, an idea of how good um, AI is. And, and the sort of very rudimentary version of it, of course, but it'll allow you to really get comfortable with it and think about, you know, the extent that you can actually use it and add, you know, add it to your day-to-day processes. Um, we, we did sort of an example in class recently where I said, you know, Hey Google, you know, tell me the GDP of like Mongolia or something like that. Right. Um, and obviously that's not something we have to deal with on a daily basis, but you know, then we sort of broke it out and I'm like, okay, well, Hey Google, tell me what, you know, the top five flights from Denver to Los Angeles are. Tell me the cheapest flights from Denver to San Diego. Um, what, what, um, you know, visas do you need for country A, country B, country C? And just doing this and showing people in the class, this is where we are now. Like you didn't even have this loaded on your machine, but instead of you doing physical, you know, Google searches with physical keystrokes, you can speak into the phone that you use every single day, all day long and, and literally get this information, bank it somewhere and and move on, you know, to other to other, you know, more important tasks. And it, I think it finally clicked. Like, oh wow, I can already do this. Right. Um, second thing is, you know, take a class. There are amazing um, online learning um, institutions out there. For instance, the classes that I'm taking are through Coursera. You know, where you just pop on, you know, pay fifty bucks, and you can get that probably written off by your company because it's it's uh, it's continued education, and just take a class. Mm-hmm. Um, the one class that I took was supposed to take three weeks. I did it in uh, two days. It's you know, if you can devote the time, then by all means, you can do it. Yeah. And so I I'd say again, don't fear it. Jump in with both feet, and uh, you'll see it's it's a lot less scary once you do. Love it. Totally agree. Um... Couldn't have put it better myself. <laughs> <laughs> you probably could. <laughs> uh, so, what about let's let's talk a little bit for a couple minutes about uh, you know you and I are men and mm-hmm. there was a U.S. census uh, mm-hmm. I think it's from 2006 to 2010 the stats were that only four percent of assistants were men. Yep. So, do you have any thoughts or observations from your time as a male assistant in a world of female-dominated <laughs> assistants? <laughs> I I do. Um, you know, 
when I started, I was a unicorn. I mean, I started back in the, you know, the sort of late, um, well, actually, I guess it was late 90s, uh, right around .com 1.0. And I think I was the only male assistant in all of Montgomery Securities at the time. And it was, again, kind of by attrition. <laughs> but it turned out to be kind of a good thing for me because it allowed me to sort of stay under the radar. Like people didn't really take me seriously anyway, especially the sort of female majority of executive assistants until I really started, you know, digging in and getting, you know, really getting my teeth into the role and asking questions and Mm -hmm. performing at a level um, that a a lot of people weren't at the time. And then it, it, it sort of clicked like, for a lot of people, it, there really wasn't a gender thing. There really was no big deal. It was just a matter of, you know, can you get it done? That's all I care about. And yeah. everything was kind of turn and burn at the time. So I don't think my gender even entered into the conversation. So, um, but where it did start to become a thing, if you will, I think is more is more recently than ever, is um, the fact that more men are entering entering um, uh, the role, and. I, I haven't really experienced any sort of, um, you know, misconduct or, you know, backbiting and fighting and all this other stuff. Um, I, I'll be honest with you, I've dealt with a lot of sabotage in my, in my career. For instance, I'll, just a quick uh, thing, when I yeah. worked at Levi Strauss, you know, I started there as um, a contractor. That's really the only way you could get in. Mm-hmm. Uh, I ended up working for someone, killed it, because that's kind of what I do, and um you know, within six months, I was supporting the president of the brand. There were there were assistants there, female specifically, who had worked there for many, 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 many years, who thought they were kind of next in line, or at least would be up for the role. Yeah. But I, I ended up getting it, you know, and I had just gotten off of being a contractor. And by them hiring me, I ended up, that was my first permanent role. So as you can imagine, I mean, my back was full of knife holes and wow. stats and everything else. And then, unfortunately, it did become this weird, you know, sort of he versus she thing, which I thought I thought was kind of ridiculous, to be honest with you. It was a really bad effort. Um, but um, inevitably, that's that's kind of what it devolved into. And I see it a lot now, even. Um, for instance, and I'm sorry, I don't want to go over time here, but I, 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 I chatted about this in a couple of my classes. And, um, for instance, uh, the class that I just had, uh, a female um, executive assistant, just kind of said, I don't want to offend you, but you know, it still kind of bums me out that you are the advocate for us, meaning us being women who we still kind of dominate this role. And I have to admit, I agree. Um, I find it, um, I always say, I find it annoying (laughs) that I have to be the one, uh, sort of out, uh, out on, you know, in the public eye and and beating the drum and kicking down doors and everything else. Yeah. But the reason I do it is because, you know, I, I'm hoping that I'm paying that privilege forward because I'm a dude. Um, let's be honest. I, I, I do get certain advantages, especially from other dudes, but you know, what I also think is it's easier for me to sort of put my neck on the chopping block than it is for a lot of women who aren't necessarily taught to be, you know, gangsta like me, if you will, or to, you know, to really speak out of turn or to really, you know, beat the drum because let's be honest, they get labeled things that just aren't fair, um, by having, you know, a strong opinion by having, you know, pointed questions, that sort of thing. So yes, I get away with it. I admit it. A lot of the posts that I post on LinkedIn, most women would never post just because, it would instantaneously, you know, bring this, this ire yeah. from, uh, from people. And it's sad that we're still in, you know, we were in 2019 and that's, that's still a thing. But, um, at the same time, I'm like, please obsolete me, you know, yeah. I'm looking forward to be obsoleted because I really want women to sort of stand in, in their power and really understand that they not only do they matter, they, they're a force and what I think I'm helping to build is this this wave of energy and and confidence and competence and and accountability, if you will, that gets women to the point where they're just like, you know what, enough. I'm not going to be you know un, you know underutilized. I'm not going to be undercompensated. I'm not going to allow people to you know make these excuses about why they won't give me a raise. This sort of thing. And I'm already sort of seeing that happen. And I'm I'm you know from the tribe even. And you've probably witnessed this. You're already seeing some people really develop, um, um, especially female, really develop into these 
you know, amazing, authoritative, well-spoken, well-prepared people who will eventually kind of take the reins, uh, hopefully from me, hopefully from you a little bit as well. And, uh, and really, and really do it and really make, make, make some change. Yeah. You know, I had a, connected with a EA in, uh, on LinkedIn and I was just asking her what, you know, what her favorite part about being an assistant was. And she yeah. wrote this like two or three paragraph masterpiece wow. of what an assistant was. And I was just like, this is, this is mind blowing. Like, I don't right. think I, I don't, I've never written, I've certainly never written anything like this and, um, let alone heard it. And I was like, you know, what, do you write? Do you have a blog? Like, what, right. you, you know, putting stuff out and she's like, well, I do poetry and whatnot. But, um, so anyway, I was like, well, you know, let's talk. Cause I'd love to let's share this snippet. Um, right. and you know, ha- get your voice out there. Cause this is, this is just crazy good. Right. So anyway, yeah, it's, I, I, I agree. I'm, I'm totally excited to uh, support and, um, do whatever I can to help, um, and encourage other, um, women that want to, you know, start their own EA coaching service or, right. um, start their own conference or whatever it is. Like, you know, we're, we're, we're in this together and we all want the same thing. We want, um, EAs to be respected and compensated fairly. And, um, yeah, so there's no reason to fight and bicker and try to, you know, play game of Thrones right. <laughs> on this thing. <laughs> exactly. Um, Exactly. So anyway, if you, uh, let's go to a couple more questions. If you got a few more minutes. Oh, of um, so what, how would you describe the job of an assistant uh, or of an assistant, um, in one, one or two sentences? Hmm. That's interesting. I'd say really it, it boils down to, you know, um, I won't use an expletive, but I think you'll understand the word I'm going to use. Um, you know, make things happen. Yeah call or dot 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 gracefully um i still believe that there's an expectation um among ourselves but then also among um our executives of things just happening things just working you know things happening seamlessly without any drama without really any conversation they just things just work and i believe the best of us still kind of follow that as, uh, almost as a mantra, you know, doing what we can, uh, you know, I, I hate that whole phrase, you know, calm from chaos thing, because who wants to step into chaos anyway, but um, I like the concept of, you know, making sure that the water on the surface is clear, even though Mount Vesuvius might be erupting underneath the water. Right. Um, I love what I do and kind of how I approach the role is making sure that the water appears perfectly clear and glassy on the surface and doing everything that I can to make sure that, you know, I, I can mitigate the, the disruption, et cetera, below the surface so that, you know, my boss can really kind of focus on the thing, uh, the things that he or she does well and that moves the needle forward, you know, helps to build the company, helps to basically put even more money in all of our pockets. Yeah. If, if it's, I take great responsibility with that because if I'm able to create that sort of calm, glassy surface, then I know for a fact that they also feel calm and able to really ideate at a level that doesn't include all of the anxiety and, and sort of stresses and, 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 you know, multiple voices, et cetera, that we're dealing with. I was born to do this as far as I'm concerned. So I'm used to dealing with quote unquote chaos. Um, but if I'm able to create uh, an environment for someone else that allows them to, again, be their best selves and to do their best work, then that's, I think, essentially why I was hired and what I, you know, what I always aspire to on a daily basis. That's great. Awesome. Well, do you have any crazy stories uh, from your <laughs> from your career as an assistant? You know, P- PG thirteen. Uh, yeah, like anything I can tell, <laughs> you know, that'll that'll clear the Apple uh, Apple sensors. Um, just rem- yeah, just remember this is a uh, public podcast, so you right. know. and and children may be listening. I got it. <laughs> just kidding. Um, yeah, I have many, as you can imagine. Um, in fact, I'm writing a book uh, with many of those in there. I'd probably say the craziest thing. Um, Wow. I don't want to tell that one. I was a little too animal house. Um, <laughs> I'd probably say one of the craziest things 
oddly enough, it, it's not a, it's not a, a happy story. It was kind of a, a sad story, but um, but it, it was one of kind of one of my proudest moments. So I at the time was working um, kind of like a hybrid EA and corporate event manager, and I was um, on a gig in Los Cabos, Mexico. And when I was there, um, it was when JFK Jr.'s plane went down. Mm. And um, one of the passengers on the plane was uh, JFK Jr.'s, I think, fiance. I don't know if they were married at the time. Or they were. Um, it was her sister, Lauren. And Lauren was actually supposed to come to my event. Um, and as you can imagine, we were there. I think they were flying her somewhere. And she was actually supposed to hop a plane and then fly to uh, Cabo to be to be at our at our event. So as you can imagine, getting the news right as I land, you know, I think a day, possibly two days before the event was um, set to begin, and her also being a part of you know the investment bank that we were kind of celebrating, who had actually helped do the deal with us. Um, it we didn't really want to cancel the event, obviously, it was, um, but. It was one of those things where I had to sort of scramble. One, I had to scramble to, to uh, you know, kind of do a little damage control, um, make sure, of course, everyone was still, you know, from that uh, that particular group was still going to be able to make it to the event, um, do whatever I could to sort of make their trips easier. So, yes, I even stepped in on their travel plans, that sort of thing, just to make sure mm -hmm. that uh, the people who were kind of, you know, grieving – Investor makers are weird, though. They don't grieve the same way the rest of us grieve. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of strange. Um, you know, so all, all that said, I was able to sort of, you know, pull all of that together, get pretty much everyone there, there. I had to fly a couple people back because they had to attend her, her funeral. Um, so they left, you know, they came in literally for a day and then they flew right back out. So I took care of all of that. One of them, you know, needed a helicopter to get from one point to another point, that kind of thing. So it it was a lot of Mount Vesuvius underneath the surface, but on the surface, it was very, very clear. It was super respectful. We even did sort of a, um, for the, the bankers that remained, we did sort of like uh, something to memorialize Lauren. Um, mm -hmm. she was a young, young banker, but it all, it all sort of worked out. But for me, it was, I, I'm a cancer, so I tend to be a little emotional and especially around death or anything like that. I, I I go the extra mile to make sure that people are sort of taken care of and, you know, preferably they're in a, a very few tears, if any. Um, oddly enough, the uh, the memorial thing that I did brought a lot of tears. So that yeah. it felt good, but also kind of bad at the same time. <laughs> like, oh, bad. Drink more. Or something else. Don't yeah. Do this. yeah. Um, so, so I'd say that was one of the craziest things because everything happened in 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 like – God, it, it just felt like it was in warp speed. Like we get the news and then I had to rush and get all of these, uh, all of these, uh, preparations sort of handled and, and also make sure that people, you know, felt okay. So it was, it was crazy. It was emotional and I was exhausted and I could not wait to get home and hug every one of my parents and, you know, all of my friends and everything else. So, wow. uh, yeah, so I thought that was probably the craziest. Sorry. It wasn't a, it wasn't a fun story. No, that's all right. That's right. one for the <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So w let's let's close with kind of a, a vulnerable one. What was the oh, yeah. biggest mistake you made oh. as an assistant, and what did you learn from the experience? Um, I'd say or one of the biggest mistakes. I'm sure you've made a few mistakes. I've, in your I've made a few. Career. Oddly enough, I I um I haven't made any like crazy ones that have like, you know, cost the company millions of dollars or anything like that. Mm -hmm. uh, they've all typically been, you know, mistakes that I've made with my bosses. And one of the biggest ones, um, was actually most recent, uh, probably happened pretty recently. Um, I ended up teaching a class. I'll, I'll make it quick. I taught a class in, um, uh, in Sydney, Australia, uh, literally left the class got on a plane and flew from Sydney to the UK. Now, if you know that, that's pretty much a 24 hour flight. So, uh, you know, we flew from, I think, uh, Sydney to Abu Dhabi. There was a layover in Abu Dhabi and then from Abu Dhabi to the UK. And then the, I, the second I hit the UK, um, I had to go to work the next morning. So there was like, you know, time to sort of 
hopefully grab some Z's or whatever mm -hmm. else because it's way different time zones. Well, unfortunately, I wasn't able to really sleep because I, my my clock was just thrown. My circadian rhythm was completely off. So I basically powered through with no sleep on Monday, um, did fine. Um, and w what it was is I was meeting my boss, oddly enough, at this humongous airline conference. It's like one of, you know, the biggest one that they do essentially um, uh, once every other year, I believe is when it is. And since we were a brand new company and also doing supersonic travel, like everybody was, you know, on us, like all the press, it was just press day, press day, press day. So uh, I was able to sort of function quite well on Monday. Then, you know, we finish up, I go back to the hotel. Um, I think I'm going to get some sleep. I still can't sleep for some reason. So long story short, I ended up staying awake until about 3 a.m. the next morning. And then I thought, okay, I've got to get some sleep or I'm literally going to pass out. So I'm like, okay, set your alarm, set my alarms, I thought. And, uh, I ended up <laughs> waking up, um, to the sound of my phone, like levitating because it was being blown up. It was my boss saying, where are you? Not in those words. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm in my room. Why? And he's like, um, we were supposed to leave 30 minutes ago and I'm meeting with Boeing in about 30 minutes. There's no way I'm going to make it. What is going on? I overslept. Wow. I thought, heard my phone and didn't hear my phone. So the single biggest meeting that the whole conference was really kind of built around, I made my boss miss. Wow. So that was the big mistake. However, true to executive assistant form, um, you know, I, I instantaneously got on the phone. I called the assistant who was the head of Boeing. I'm like, okay, um, do you have any other blocks where I can get, you know, squeeze my boss in? I'm sorry. I told her the whole story. And one thing I love about assistants, when we're desperate, <laughs> we, we show up for each other. And she could tell. I was like almost in tears because I'm like, well, I'm basically fired. So at least let me get him this, you know, get him somehow. On the way him. out. <laughs> exactly. I need to at least get this meeting so that, uh, so that that he can fire me and not completely flame me if I ever ask for a recommendation. So I was able to find another time. It was like uh, about an hour and a half later. I called him back. He ended up taking an Uber and, and uh, I finally got to uh, got to the event. He didn't talk to me for pretty much all of it. And, uh, and then uh, he did make his meeting, um, which led to another meeting and then another meeting. And uh, so it all, it, oddly enough, it all worked out. Uh, but by far that was the biggest mistake I've ever made as an executive assistant. And I was so annoyed that it had to happen <laughs> while we're in, in the, you know, in the UK and it was my birthday on top of all that. Well, that's fun. That's fun. <laughs> you know, <laughs> what, uh, what, did, what did you learn from that in the sense of how did you deal with that with your boss? Funny thing is, we ended up going out. Uh, we had to. Go, we stayed in the same hotel, uh, so we took you know a car. We always took uh, the car both to and from the event together. And of course, I was you know since he wasn't talking to me, I was kind of like sick to my stomach for the entire day. Right. And uh, and then we had to we had to go back. So I made sure that of course everything was seamless, everything was perfect. Uh, but we ended up. Um, finding we took a detour and then it's like hey let's go have a drink and i was like oh lord i'm gonna get fired now so all right at least i'll be a little bit of a buzz to get fired with and uh, we sat down and we just talked and he goes okay we're only going to talk about this once what the heck happened and i told him i'm like you know what i overdid it i flying you know transatlantically and you know i didn't have any sleep i swear i set my alarm i think i probably slept through it you know it, it's it's I don't know what else to tell you. I, I really am sorry. I mean, I know this was like the biggest meeting ever. I did my best to sort of cover up the tracks. And he goes, no, no, to your credit, you were able to get me in. So that was really the most important thing. But he's like, this makes me, I won't lie, this makes me kind of worry about you. I mean, mm -hmm. are you going to be able to do this? I mean, yeah. you were doing something that was extracurricular and it affected me. Yeah. Um, and, um, and I, I completely agreed. I told him, I'm like, you're exactly right. I, I thought I could do it. I thought I was Superman, but you know, I'm almost 50 you know, and I have to admit my own faults at some point. And this was not the way I wanted to figure that out for myself, but you know, I, I, I trust me now I completely understand, um, how this can't happen again. And I, and, and I'm like, please don't fire me, but I totally understand if you have to, he's like, shut up. I'm going to fire you. I just don't want this ever to happen again. And I'm like, right. it won't. I assure you worst mistake of my entire career. And, uh, yeah, I feel a lot worse and I'm beating myself up a lot worse inside than you ever could. So please know that. And, uh, we were fine after that, oddly enough. 
So that's awesome. So there's something yeah. very, uh, something very humbling about admitting you screwed up. <laughs> yeah, that's the best thing to do, though. I mean, had yeah. I come like a billion excuses or yeah. you know tried to play it off as you know, well, well, then you shouldn't have asked me to come from you know right. that just it doesn't fly. If you make a mistake, just own it, own up to it, and and you know do the best that you can to to fix it and and make it go away, <laughs> however yep. you can. So. Awesome. Well, what's, uh, I am going to ask you one more. I know I said that was the last question. Uh, what, what's one tip that you would give executives to help them get more out of their assistant? I'd say have a little bit more trust that we actually know a lot more than you think we know. Um, I think a lot of executive assistants, especially when they're at this level, um, at my level, at your level, We've been through a lot. Uh, we've we've probably worked in a different industry. We've probably seen way more, oddly enough, than a lot of executives that we support have seen. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I think that gets lost in translation somehow. Um, I've lived a pretty fantastic life. I've lived in you know five different countries. I've I've traveled to probably twenty, um, which means I'm, I know travel like you would not believe. I, my my itineraries are seamless. I should have been a travel agent. I'm sure I would have paid a lot more. Um, you know, it's I've had experiences uh, both within work and with, outside of work. Um, just you know, from, from who I am as a person. I mean, I used to be a professional singer and I toured the world as a singer and was able to sort of see that side, the entertainment business side, as well as the travel side, as well as the management of groups and hotel stays and all of that. So I think what executives kind of fail to realize is that we see things in a much, you know, larger vision and with a different sort of view and a different sort of empathy than they do. And that kind of experience and that kind of, you know, visibility and reach, especially, I mean, think about the tribe that I've created, you know, we have this, these connections that anything we don't know, we can probably find out in record time. And I think executives, first of all, don't realize it. And, and most importantly, they don't exploit that. Mm-hmm. They instead think that we, you know, get coffee and keep the calendar clean and, you know, book travel when those are things we can do in our sleep, literally. We think in you know much larger terms, like a lot of the sort of real um, business aspects, a lot of the strategic work, a lot of the sort of interpersonal communications within the team, all of that stuff, we actually handle. They just don't know it. And we don't advocate on our own behalf enough uh, to let them know that that's what we do. It's not in our job description, therefore it doesn't exist in their eyes. But you know, we know for a fact that we actually do it and that we're not compensated for it, that actually our, our, our desire almost isn't necessarily to be compensated. It's really just to be validated that we know it, we're handling it, and, mm-hmm. and we have their respect. So you know, to your question, I think executives really need to, to really listen and, and, and really ask questions of their executive assistants and, and give them you know, more needle-moving work, give them projects and help you know, offer uh, tutelage and mentorship and course corrects and all of that and, and have faith that we'll figure it out. We may not know exactly, you know, what they know. We didn't go to the same, you know, high priced schools and all of that, but we actually know a lot. And I think it's, uh, I think it's time that executives at least acknowledge it or at least, you know, poke around and, and see how much we know. And, uh, and I think they'd be really, really surprised to, to, to see that, you know, we're, we're a force. We're, we're some smart kids. That's awesome. Yeah, I agree. Definitely. Uh, I've seen a lot of executives, um, you know, they're like, okay, well, what, you know, my assistant really doesn't do enough or whatever. And I was like, well, do you trust them? Right. Do you, do you actually, you know, ask them for their help? Um, right. Ask, ask, or their opinion. <laughs> ask them for their <laughs> opinion. Ask, ask them to help you make a decision. Right. Um, or ask them to make a decision. Right. Um, you know, I love that. You've got to, you've got to trust. So cool. Well, what's, uh, what's one book or resource that you would recommend all assistants check out? Um, my big one, um, and you probably know this is, um, it's called, the book is called Essentialism by, mm-hmm. um, McEwen. Uh, God, I forgot his first name. Greg. Uh, I think. Greg. Yeah. Yeah. And the reason I say that is I, I believe if we boil things down, I, for me, I found that book incredibly empowering because, you know, one of the biggest, um, the biggest sort of tenets he espouses in the book is 
um, getting comfortable with the word no and getting comfortable with saying no, even to people in power. Uh, for instance, I stopped attending meetings because I read that book and I'm like, this meeting was worthless. I'm not going. Right. <laughs> and I just wouldn't show up for the meeting. You know, I'd yeah. be like, give me the, give me the cliff notes version. I don't need to sit in a meeting for, you know, 45 minutes with, you know, basically in silence because you're not going to call on me. I'm not going to be asked for anything. So why wouldn't I spend time doing work and get a cliff notes version from you guys via the notes that someone's taking, um, instead of, you know, sitting there wasting my and company time. So, um, one thing I, again, that I love about that book is it, it gets you in a different mindset. It gets you out of this sort of sheep mentality, if you will. Mm -hmm. And it, and it almost sort of empowers you to make better decisions and to, to do only the things that are essential, like cut out all the chaff, cut out all of the, the sort of worthless, non, you know, compensatable, <laughs> you know, <laughs> right. BS and, and really just focus on the things that move the needle, things that work, things that, you know, that really can get things done and, and create an outcome that you're trying to create in exponentially faster time than wasting time doing things you really don't want to do. And it, it applies both to, you know, the work that you do um, when you go to the office every day, as well as in your personal life. Like that was one of the things about saying no is, you know, being invited to a wedding you really don't want to go to. You don't know anybody there. So I was like, no, you know, I'd much rather spend time with my kids or I'd rather spend time learning something as opposed to going to a wedding, sitting there, eating crap food with a bunch of people at a table I've never met, probably will never speak to again. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. I, I just think the book, you know, really kind of shook me in such a way where it's like, okay, this makes sense. And, uh, I followed, I've pretty much followed it ever since. And I, I literally hand that out as uh, Christmas presents, um, every year, just because I think a lot of people really, really dig it. And when they really read it and they, and they start kind of applying some of the things that he talks about their life changes in some way, you know? Yeah, I, I agree with your point about it empowering people. You know, I I read it, um, and then I read it with my wife, or listened mm -hmm. to the audiobook with my wife while we were on nice. vacation, which is a good time to listen to that book oh, when you're on yeah. vacation. Um, but like, you know, it's like it empowers you to say no, and empowers you. To, oh, you know what? I don't have to be a jerk about it, but I, I don't. don't have to say yes all the time. Exactly, and, so, and I think people respect people who have the ability to say no. I yeah. love someone that's like no. And you kind of look at them like, wait, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> You're not doing like what everyone else is doing, and that would be a no. Um, and and they're perfectly confident in in sort of saying it like that is hot to me, as opposed to that sort of waffly thing, which is really big in business right now. The the whole maybe uh, phenomenon, like I, I hate that. I think I saw that in a, um, one of the calendar invite um, applications or something where mm -hmm. they give you a no maybe. Who who on earth? wants to live a life of maybe, right. You know, give me yes or no real simple. And yeah. so cool. Well, Phoenix, thanks so much for your time. Um, sure. really, My pleasure. really, grateful for again your support over the last year or two and just hopping on my podcast for my very first podcast interview that's what I'm very excited for so honored by um, the way. Thank you. <laughs> so, you know, you said you've got a book coming out um, mm -hmm. soon. And then you've got the tribe you, uh, mm -hmm. and then you've got the online, um, community. So where can we find you? Where can those listening find you online? And, uh, what would be the best thing to do if they wanted to reach out to you? Oh, sure. I think for me, um, I pretty much live on LinkedIn. I won't lie. Um, I, my life is literally on LinkedIn. So, um, I write a, feels like a million articles there, mm -hmm. um, all, all with some good information. So, you know, definitely, uh, connect to connect with me on LinkedIn and read everything, uh, because there's always some tips and tricks in there. Um, phoenixnorman.com is where you'll find, um, I do some personal coaching as well to both executive assistants and my new jam is, uh, first time CEOs. Mm -hmm. Um, and they're usually pre IPO, you know, series A, series B type CEOs. Um, so I, um, you can find me there in book sessions as well. And other than that, you can find me on this, my tribe, T H I S my T R I B E dot com. And that's where you will find, um, information about the, both the private tribe as well as, uh, the tribe, uh, workshops that I teach around the world. So those awesome. are my, my three places. Awesome. Well, it, um, I'll put all those links on the uh, show notes as well so people can easily find you. Um, Perfect. But yeah, thanks again, man. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll look forward to seeing you soon. And um, yeah, thanks so much. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Jeremy. And congratulations again. Yeah, thanks. See you later, alligator. <laughs> hey. 
check out this week's show notes at leaderassistant.com forward slash eight. GoBullows.com.